From CBS News headquarters in New York, this is the CBS Evening News with Roger Mudd, substituting for Walter Cronkite, and Robert Shackney in Buenos Aires, Bert Quint in Rome, Richard Roth in Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, Terry Drinkwater in Kentfield, California. In Washington, Dan Rather, Daniel Shore, and Leslie Stahl. Good evening. President Nixon is reported resting with more ease this evening. He continues to receive treatment for viral pneumonia at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland, where he checked in last night. Dan Rather has a report. The latest official medical report issued at 3.30 this afternoon, Washington time, says the president is still experiencing pain in his chest. It's in the right side of the chest, away from the heart. Doctors insist that it is nothing more, nothing less, than a clear case of viral pneumonia. The president is expected to be hospitalized a week or ten days and will be advised to continue taking things easy for an undetermined amount of time after that. Treatment consists of chest therapy four times a day. In a hastily arranged hospital briefing room, doctors this morning gave other details of the president's treatment and condition. In order for the president to get some rest last night, he did have a restless night. We had to give him a strong <laughs> analgesic by injection. He got a total of about four hours sleep, and that was late in the morning. This morning, he's still uncomfortable, although we have not given him any more injections to give him relief from pain. Uh, for those of you um, who may anticipate the question, or I may, <clears throat> I may anticipate the question, is why didn't we get him in the hospital immediately? The president insisted on carrying on his schedule, and we had difficulty in uh, convincing him that he really was a sick man. Uh, he still wants to continue work at a greater pace than I would like to see him do now, but between the staff and myself, I think we'll come up with a schedule that uh, will allow him to recover and recuperate and uh, do some of his work. The recommended therapy for this kind of pneumonia, if it turns out to be a viral or a atypical pneumonia, is a, a period of uh, inactivity with medication for approximately seven to ten days. He didn't like what I told him, namely that he might not feel quite up to par even after he left the hospital because there is considerable uh, malaise and uh, uneasiness and a feeling of a lack of energy that may continue for uh, some period after uh, leaving the hospital. News Secretary Ziegler scoffed at suggestions that the president's illness might add to what some people claim is an already existing Watergate-caused partial paralysis in government. For example, Ziegler says the president, while in hospital, may still go ahead with announcement of first stages for his new phase four economic program. On the other hand, Ziegler says, that during hospitalization, the president definitely will not hold his promised meeting with Senator Irvin about the Watergate investigation. On another subject, CBS News Today was told that President Nixon has said privately he expects to name Dr. Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State, to succeed William Rogers, possibly as early as September. Rogers left today for Japan and was unavailable for comment. Dr. Kissinger, reached by telephone tonight, said, and I quote, the president has not discussed that with me. The White House press office had no comment. Other White House sources confirmed that such plans for Kissinger to succeed Rogers do exist, but said such plans should not be considered final until announced. Dan Rather, CBS News at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. On his 50th day as president of Argentina, Hector Campora resigned, clearing the way for Juan Perón's return to power. Robert Chackney in Buenos Aires has the latest developments. They come to cheer in small groups last night in front of Juan Perón's residence. The word had spread the wily master politician had made his move to take over as president of Argentina, to assume the country's leadership in legal fact, vindication at age 77 for this prototype of the Latin American strongman. Almost 18 years after the army had overthrown him, he had outmaneuvered all his enemies. It was a totally unexpected development, but perhaps it should not have been. Perón had quietly met already with the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, apparently won his support. In most of Buenos Aires today, you never would have known that an extraordinary event was taking place. No sign of police or army who usually appear at times of political crisis. Only in the Plaza de Mayo, in front of the Casa Rosada, or Pink House, the presidential office, a crowd had gathered. Inside, the climactic events were beginning. President Hector Campora, Perón's longtime associate, was explaining why he was resigning. He made repeated appearances all day long. 
There were labor leaders in one audience. There were meetings with political leaders as well. There was the attempt, not yet successful, to win the support of Ricardo Balbin, the principal opposition leader whom Perón supposedly wants as vice president in the government he plans to form. In his televised speeches to the country, President Capra said he was resigning because he had taken the post only to assist Perón's return to power. Now that Perón was back, he, Capra, and his vice president were both withdrawing so the popular will could be obeyed. All that remains now is for the Peronist Control Congress, which was meeting this evening, to establish the constitutional formalities for the changeover, probably another election. Perón was personally taking power, it's now believed, in order to establish his clear control over feuding left-wing factions of his movement. It was to be Peronism again for Argentina, not socialism, not revolution, but the unchallenged leadership of a strong man who's come all the way back. Robert Shackney, CBS News, Buenos Aires. Massacres as gruesome as Investors' concern for President Nixon's health today helped send the Dow Jones Industrials down almost 16 points on the New York Stock Exchange. Volume was 11,400,000 shares. The average price per share lost 45 cents on the New York Exchange and a, uh, and a penny on the American. Secret Service agents have arrested three employees of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in connection with the theft of $13,000 in new $10 and $20 bills. Agents say they have recovered $6,800 and are still searching for the rest. Maryland State Legislator James Scott Jr. was found shot to death early today in the basement of his Baltimore apartment. He was scheduled to go on trial August 20th on charges of heroin trafficking. Baltimore police said his murder apparently was a professional contract job arranged by East Coast heroin smuggling rackets. The Baltimore News American quoted one source as saying Scott was considering telling federal prosecutors the names of some of the big top narcotics figures. The Senate today moved toward passage Tuesday of a bill to permit construction of the Trans-Alaskan Oil Pipeline running from Prudhoe Bay in the north to the port of Valdez. The Senate rejected an amendment that would have delayed the $3.5 billion project for another year while a study was made of an alternate route through Canada. The vote was uh, a defeat for the environmentalists to oppose the pipeline. Just a month ago, we reported that Martha's Vineyard Island off Cape Cod was suffering from a serious run on gasoline. Since then, the situation has improved considerably. Richard Roth reports. Tourism here is big business, and talk last month of a gasoline shortage that could discourage tourism was definitely not good for business. In an epic overstatement, one politician even warned there would be 6,000 people on welfare here if the island didn't get more gas, and only 7,000 people live here year-round. But the summer population swells to 45,000, a lot of people coming by car on the ferry. And all the cars and the boats burn up a lot of gas. Only two oil companies sell to dealers here. When they began limiting the amount they'd sell, people who depend on tourism started worrying. A real quandary. Publicize the gas problem and you may run out of tourists. Ignore the problem and you may run out of gas. As far as I could see, it was going to kill the whole island economy because people were starting to cancel hotel rooms, cancel uh, house rentals, and so on. And that the whole island needed the gas, needed the tourism, because that was what our economy is based on, 100%. And without it, we were going to die. The oil companies say they changed their policies, brought in more gasoline, because the vineyard is unique. It is an island. Also, two gas stations had closed during the past year, and because of allocations, less gasoline was reaching the island this year. But it was just a few days after the vineyard's unique situation got national attention that the gas stations got more gas. And that has made some folks skeptical. I feel that it's just a... Uh major oil company uh, bought, like, you know, like just to raise the prices of gasoline. Well, just a story, you know, excitement. Anything for a story. Well, I have to say, no to <laughs> <laughs> I'm conservation chairman of the Ridgefield Gardens Club, and I don't think there's any scarcity at all. It's these that want to make it just for large oh, distributors <laughs> and to get the Alaska pipeline put through. I don't believe a word of it. With the gasoline flowing plenty now, the Chamber of Commerce says the dilemma is behind us. Maybe, but in a few months when the tourists are gone and the New England weather turns cold, it won't be gasoline in demand here, it will be heating oil. And the oil companies already predict there'll be a shortage of that too. Richard Roth, CBS News, Martha's Vineyard. 
Actor Lon Chaney Jr. died yesterday at his home in San Clemente, California. He was 58. His wife declined to specify the cause of death. Following in the footsteps of his father, he played monster roles in such films as Count Dracula, The Mummy, and The Wolfman. The National Transportation Safety Board today said the plane in which baseball star Roberto Clemente and four others were killed was overloaded and had two bad engines. The DC-7 plane crashed shortly after takeoff from Puerto Rico on New Year's Eve. The men had hired the plane from a Puerto Rican charter company to fly supplies to earthquake victims in Managua, Nicaragua. The safety board said the plane had not been flown in four months, that its flight engineer was unqualified for his job, and that the co-pilot had only six hours' experience in a DC-7.